Um, as many of you know, women in STEM from all backgrounds are underrepresented uh, in STEM fields, and so we're fortunate today to hear from these ladies, but especially so uh, women and underrepresented women sort of we live at the intersection of those groups, right? So we're underrepresented, but we're also female, and oftentimes we're overlooked when, when you hear initiatives for underrepresented minorities and women. It's really white women and men and women of color, and so I'm glad that we're gonna focus on women of color today and hear from our wonderful panelists. Thank you, ladies, so much. Thank you. Um, let me ask our first question. What is, in these questions, by the way, we poll the Sockness community, and so um, we sent out email requests and, and did social media, and so you all have sent in these questions that we've gone through and, and selected uh, ones that had the most overlap, and so we have a list of questions that were submitted from the Sockness community, so thank you for that. First question, what is the most important topic right now in each of your respective STEM fields? So I work for IBM Corporation, which is a worldwide company of over 400,000 employees. I'm a distinguished engineer and a master inventor at IBM, which means I'm one of their top technical resources, probably among the top 50 within the corporation. I think uh, some of the things that are of interest at the corporation at this point in time is cognitive technology. Um, so that's uh, working with computer technology to try and make it think, see, feel like human beings. Uh, we're into a lot of you know, development of products and services in the areas of cloud, analytics, mobile, and social. And so I really do have a really, really fun time at IBM working with our clients to build prototypes in each of these different areas. Fantastic. Thanks, Amelia. Sure. So I'm Deb Prinky, and by the way, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I lead a research director at the NSA, and this is the largest in-house research organization in the intelligence community, perhaps one of the largest in federal government. And, and our, it's hard for me to pick which is the most important field because our job is to create breakthroughs in all kinds of STEM mm. disciplines that help keep this nation safer and more secure. But just to pick a couple, when I think about cybersecurity in particular, one thing that's critical is attribution, understanding who has done what to whom is critical. Uh, resilience so that systems can defend themselves if they need to. When we think about mathematics, the ability to deal with cryptography is key. And cross-cutting all of this with the rise of big data and analytics being so important, machine learning we're finding as many challenges and many things that we need to address in that discipline. Fantastic. Mary Jo. Skonagoa, Mary Jo Yuyats. Uh, great piece to you. My name is Mary Jo and Niawa, thank you for inviting me uh, here. There are a lot of exciting problems, uh, current problems in my field. Uh, problems related to unraveling the, the genome, understanding RNA, uh, big data, how to use big data to make discoveries in chemistry and medicine, uh, new ways to deliver drugs. Uh, it's hard, there's a lot of, lot of exciting uh, problems now. It's an exciting time to be a scientist. Fantastic. You all are each doing such amazing things at this point, this pinnacle in your career. Can you talk a little bit about your background and sort of what led you to this point? So for myself, I'm a graduate of the University of Texas in Austin with a degree in computer science. Oh, hook em horns. Uh, so I uh, graduated in 1982 and I started as a, at IBM as a software developer and we were having one of the conversations with the experts earlier today. We were talking a little bit about, you know, when you get started in your career, it's interesting to, to look at internships and find opportunities within major corporations. I love the ability to work for a large corporation because there's so much flexibility. And I've had probably about, you know, eight different jobs as I've worked around IBM. I um, certainly started as a software developer doing a lot of uh, assembly programming and mainframe type programming. Evolved my career to do C, C++, Java programming, and then uh, I moved over to the Dallas-Fort Worth area where I am today and supported a lot of our IBM products and technology, and I've just had the wonderful opportunity to be working with clients, and so what I do is I help develop and design implementation prototypes of some of the clients' most you know, difficult challenges that they face, and they'll come to our team, and part of what I love doing is just innovating with those clients and coming up with really cool uh, ideas and frameworks and you know, deep technology type of things that we patent. So right now I have over uh, 25 U.S. patents and I have about another 25 pending. That's amazing. Wow. wow. Tell us a little about, uh, about your background, Deborah. So my background's been uh, a little eclectic and I guess I would be the poster child for saying what you think you might want to do today may not be what you end up doing long term. <laughs> 
and I guess I haven't done anything long term. <laughs> So I'll take you just briefly back to graduate school. In graduate school, I thought I was aiming for veterinary medicine. And then the Morris worm hit in 88, and I was so angry. It took down my computer system and took out my homework. Mm. Not acceptable. <laughs> Someone might say that 25 years is a long time to bear a grudge. But uh, so that turned me <laughs> It happens. So I switched over to computer security, computer science and computer security, and then decided to enter academia and spent a lot of years there, 12 years, went through the full professor ranks, did a startup company, got itchy feet, went to the Department of Energy as their chief scientist for cybersecurity while I was trying to figure out what to do. Stayed there seven years, really thoroughly enjoyed it, and then, make a long story short, four years ago, the agency gave me a call, said, Deb, would you come work for us? And I started there as their uh, assistant uh, to Mike Wertheimer, my predecessor as leader uh, for the research directorate. It spent a year for my diversity assignment, heading up education and training, and then came back as the director this last September. Mm -hmm. So it's been quite a winding way. Fantastic. Mary Jo, a bit about your background. I'm a member of the Ganawage Mohawk Band, Eternal Clan. Uh, probability says I shouldn't be here, like, like the gentleman said yesterday. Uh, but my mom told me that I could do anything I wanted with my life if I worked at it. Uh, so I attended a public school system where you don't learn much, but I, I had the teachings of my elders. <laughs> uh, I, I had the teachings of my elders, and I got a scholarship to Reed College in Portland, Oregon, where I was hopelessly behind everybody else, but I was too naive to understand that I was so far behind everybody else. So I uh, worked like crazy and, and uh, managed to, to uh, do well enough to graduate and get into a PhD program. And then I, I got my PhD at Northwestern. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, that, that's, that's how, that was my path. Fantastic, thank you. Um, many of our Sagnistas uh, wrestle with how to incorporate their culture into their career. Can you share a bit about um, how you've incorporated your culture into your respective roles? You want me to yes. start? Yes, yeah. I'd love to. Okay. Um, so, uh, being Hispanic, um, there aren't a whole lot of Hispanics at IBM, and so I want to encourage you to pursue careers at IBM for that precise reason. I would say 30 years ago when I started with a company, it was rare when I'd see a female or a Hispanic around me, and nowadays I do see some, but probably not as many as I would like to see like I see around me today. Um, so I would encourage you there. I would say in terms of my culture, uh, one of the things that I do as a distinguished engineer is I am responsible for uh, a lot of the work that gets done in Latin America. So I travel to you know, all parts of Latin America. I've been to you know, Mexico, uh, Guadalajara, to you know, Monterrey, to Argentina, to Venezuela, to Brazil, and just uh, get to meet with all of the technical community that we have in each of those geographies. I get to work with clients in those areas. So I work and specialize in the area of you know, public sector and smarter cities and the creation of smarter cities. I've been working with the city of New Orleans as well as you know, uh, Guadalajara to create smarter cities in those environments. And that's really challenging work. Um, so I've enjoyed incorporating my Hispanic background and culture. Si hablo mucho en español, voy a dar presentaciones en español. Um, so I presented about Watson Technologies um, most recently in Guadalajara at a hackathon that we had for young entrepreneurs um, trying to learn and, and teach them about Bluemix and IBM Technologies. So I've had the ability to incorporate a lot of my culture into what I'm doing. Fantastic, fantastic, thank you. Deborah. Mm. Great. Well, I can't give quite as long an answer for that. Uh, my culture is Caucasian, mm -hmm. and, uh, but actually, I self-identify as geek. <laughs> so, I, so I will tell you how I incorporate it. Um, professional suit Fitbit <laughs> um, is part of it. Um, but perhaps more seriously, what I try to do is bring my whole self to work every day. And I think that my table over there will say that I might not look like the standard nsa <laughs> Um, but um, despite that, I'm fully accepted on the senior leadership team. So I found that bringing that ex external perspective into my agency by speaking about those things that I know from having spent most of my time outside our secret walls 
uh, by working as a woman, one of the few in my discipline, uh, way before it was popular, people went more into the mathematical side than into the intrusion detection where I worked even in cyber, that that's been possible to bring it forward. But, but in fact, I actually find thinking about myself as a person and bringing that forward is really where I would self-identify more. Wonderful, that's wonderful, thank you. Mary Jo, tell us how you've incorporated your culture into your career. Well, my culture and my values pervade everything that I do, whether I'm unraveling the secrets of the genome or, or trying to discover new drugs, whatever, whatever I'm working on, if I'm working with students, uh, working on university policy, my culture and my values come with me. And that's one of the very important uh, reasons for the SACNAS mission and for our mission at ACES is that we need more people to bring our values into the scientific enterprise. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. And I also, I, I also serve the, the urban Indian community uh, at our Indian Center, and, and I give back to my people in every way that I can. Uh, for example, I'm an experienced grant writer, as most professors are, so I do pro bono grant writing for Indian organizations. And, and so there's a tremendous overlap between my culture and my science. It's fantastic, thank you, thank you. This was a, a wonderful question we got that talked about how we believe and how we perceive ourselves. It says the beliefs about ourselves impact our fruitfulness positively and negatively. Which self-beliefs had a positive impact on your success and which had a negative impact? And secondly, what did you do or what do you currently do to bolster your positive beliefs or to purge those negative beliefs? So in terms of uh, positive beliefs, I think, you know, every day my mom would drop me off in, you know, uh, elementary school when I was little and she'd always say, Romelia, haz lo mejor que puedas, do your very best. Mm. And I think that stayed ingrained in my mind after she drilled it into me every single day. And so a lot of what I tried to do was just do my very best, whether it be in school or you know, at work or doing uh, things with my children, my husband, my family, trying to do the very best that I can for all of them. And I think that's had a very positive effect in my life. Um, certainly, you know, someone uh, right before us was talking about, you know, as a Hispanic, you do tend to focus a lot, you know, on your family and your culture. And certainly I do that. And I think that has all been a very positive experience for me. In terms of uh, negative things, I would say being a Hispanic female, you do tend to be very reserved sometimes. You tend to be very quiet, especially when you're younger. And I would say it took uh, a lot of pushing within myself to say, you know, you can get out, you can give presentations, you can talk to thousands of people in front of you, you can excel and you can do good work. And so I take pride in everything that I do every day now. Fantastic. It's amazing. Ever tell us how you get rid of those negative beliefs and bolster positive beliefs in yourself. Well, I think perhaps the most important positive view that I've had, and this has served me well through my life, not just my career, has been the belief that no matter what negative thing happens, that through some hard work, you can achieve a benefit. And I don't mean this in a Pollyanna, everything that happens negative is good. I am a two-time breast cancer survivor. Mm. My My husband died of pancreatic cancer nearly two years ago. Mm. I have been divorced. I've had a lot of things that have gone right in my life. I've had a lot of challenges. What I've found through each of those things is by thinking through what is it that I have learned from them and how do I apply them to make the world better, to make myself better, mm. not in the instant but in the long term, gone a long way. For instance, the cancer experience. Because I had had cancer once, I understood how to get Jeff the help that he needed to make his last year better. I would not trade that for the world. Mm -hmm. So that's been crucial to me. In terms of negative beliefs, this is one that I wrestle with all the time. Who knows what imposter syndrome is? Imposter syndrome? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you think that they're finally going to figure out <laughs> <laughs> that you haven't done what you need to do, and so you move on. In a sense, it's been a positive because it tends to make me move on and try to do more and more and learn more and more. It's been hard because it makes me edgy sometimes. It's only really been in the last few years when I've been able to sit back and say, here, I am good enough, and what I'm bringing to the table today is enough. 
It's taken me most of my career to get there, though. A lot of it's been edgy, imposter syndrome. They're going to find me out. Trust me, they're not going to find you out. <laughs> you really are that good. I love it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Here you go. Okay, well, uh, I had to overcome some, some cultural barriers. Like, uh, I was taught that you don't approach authority figures, you don't approach older people. Uh, and uh, in my field, you have to be a little mm -hmm. bit assertive and put right. yourself out there. So I, I had to overcome that. Uh, but as I said, my mom told me that I could do anything I wanted if I tried. And she told me over and over and over again, and I believed her. You know? mm -hmm. and, and so those of you who are parents, and many of you will someday be parents, tell your child over and over again, you can do whatever you want if you try, because if you tell them over and over again, they will believe you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, Sockness is fortunate to have de developed uh, through support from, from many of our elders a Sockness Leadership Institute where we're starting to groom the next generation of leadership. I'd love to hear your thoughts about what you think it takes to be an effective leader. So in terms of being an effective leader, um, I'd say that's a tough question. I think you have to be well-rounded. Um, in a corporation, you have to be able to have competence, right? You have to be you know, intelligent about the things you're doing and well-versed in technology. Um, I'd say you also have to have some strong communication skills. I know um, a lot of the young folks that I work with, I try and tell them it's not just about verbally articulating things, but it's also about being an effective writer and being able to communicate your thoughts and your ideas. It's also about being able to collaborate with others and being able to you know, work well together and making sure that you're getting along and that you know who's who within your organization and be savvy about what you're, who you're networking with. Um, it's also about community and being able to give back to your local communities wherever you're at. I know uh, one of the things I love doing is I am on the board at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History and I spend a lot of time working with our Hispanic community at the museum. Um, one of my most recent projects was taking IBM's Think exhibit out of Epcot and moving it over to the Fort Worth area. And so now a lot of our Hispanic community, as well as the general public there in Fort Worth and Dallas is gonna be able to enjoy that exhibit. So I think all of those are keys to success, you know, um, and I call them the C's of success, you know, competence, collaboration, community, you know, and there's several more. Um, so I think those are the key ones, though, that I would focus on as I was moving forward in my career. Fantastic. Thank you. Deborah, tell us about leadership uh, as you see it. I'd be happy to. So putting my scientist hat on, which I never really take off, um, there actually have been studies that show that just about any style of leadership can be effective if you pair it with the right situation. But I'll talk about the kind of leadership that I value the most. And it really is very simple. We have a brain and we have a heart. We need to use them both at work. And a heart doesn't mean a bleeding heart. Mm -hmm. A heart sometimes means taking a tough line with a staff person and giving them that feedback that says you're just not making it. And a heart also is a heart that lets you sit down next to somebody who's lost a person dear to them in your office in front of the male colleagues. Mm -hmm. And if you need to cry with them, do so or take their hand. Being a leader to me is about being there for your people while keeping your eye on the mission, achieving what your goal is. For us, it's the safety of the country. But if I let my people go in the midst of that, then what have we accomplished? We've changed ourselves to something bad. Mm. So head and heart, use them both. Mm. Wow. So so these, these are very good words <laughs> that my colleagues have shared. <laughs> We need to start on that side I, next time. <laughs> <laughs> Am I next? I will start with you next. Tell us um, what motivated you to go into a STEM field. Yeah, obviously, we're all you all are so wonderful and intelligent. You could have done anything. Why STEM? Why did you become passionate about it? Was it a per particular person that inspired you? Um, my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad uh, taught me about the sky. He used to take me out when I was little and show me the different stars and, and tell me about the sky. And then my mom would take me to the museum, the Natural History Museum, every Saturday. 
and we learn about sea animals and rocks and uh, you know when you when you learn about exciting stuff then then you get you, you get bitten by the bug you want to stay with it so that's that's how I got interested in science mm. but if I could add something about leadership listening and allowing the people that you that you supervise to own what they do are very important Fantastic. also yes thank you thank you Deborah, tell us about your first interaction with, with STEM or science and what brought you oh. into that field. Well, so I guess I started with a veterinary medicine because I loved animals. Um, when I was a kid, actually, kindergarten, we went to UC Davis and from kindergarten until master's degree, I was gonna be a veterinarian and, because I loved animals and go to UC Davis and I loved nature and being outside. I switched over, as you saw, I, I joked a little bit about it because of anger but partly I was drawn to the beauty of math and the ability to solve problems. And I found with computer science, you could do that even better. And even now, uh, problem solving is part of what I like best about it being a leader of scientists and helping smooth their way so they can focus on what they need to do and helping apply that to the problems of others. Sure. So I think it's that beauty of the problem solving, but combined with the appreciation of the real world out there, whether it's animals or people. Fantastic, thank you. Amelia, tell us about how you got interested in STEM. Sure. So uh, as a child, I loved puzzles. I'm very competitive in nature, and uh, I'm a quiet competitor. I don't go out there and, and you know vocally do things, but I am very strategic in moves I make and what I want to do. Um, so I know, you know a couple of the traits that I have are loving puzzles and loving to solve problems and being able to be competitive. Um, so as I went into college at the University of Texas, I started out as a biology major and quickly found that my grades weren't as good as I wanted them to be. Um, but I usually math just came very easy to me. And I noticed, gee, you know, I'm, I have you know, 4.0 in all my math courses, so maybe I ought to switch over to be a math major. And I know this is probably going to sound foreign to you know, a lot of the young folks in the audience today. Um, when I was in college, that was the very first time that I was exposed to a computer. You know, and so you know, when I started uh, taking one computer class and I started seeing, wow, this is pretty logical, it makes perfect sense to me, um, I started excelling in that area as well, and that's what you know, made me hone in in you know, computer science. And then along the way, I met a very handsome uh, electrical engineer, and so I took a lot of electrical engineering courses as well. <laughs> Um, but I did graduate listening? with that affinity yeah. and, um, and certainly, you know, have always had a love for programming and doing things of that nature. And even today, you know, as I sit in the evenings with my son doing homework, I'm learning Python. And he looks at me and he says, well, you don't know Python. You don't know anything about that. I said, I am a computer science major. So I think all of that has yes. led me to continue to have a love for science, technology, engineering, and math. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yesterday evening, we had a reception for those in our community who identify as, as part of the LGBTQA um, group, and, and it was great to, to, to see so many people who were there to support and also felt like that was such a safe space. Mary Jo, I know you identify as a queer woman of color. Can you share a little bit about your experience um, growing up at the, the sort of the intersection of these groups and how, how that's been for you? Well, I'm married to a wonderful woman. Her name is Amy, and she's a software engineer. And <laughs> thank God for Massachusetts and, <laughs> and also Northeastern University that was one of the first universities to have a policy of non-discrimination mm. on the basis of sexual orientation. So in that sense, I've had it easier than a lot of uh, Saknesis from the more redneck parts of the country. <laughs> but I want to say that my, my relationship with Amy has made me a better professor and a better scientist. I think both of us, our careers were boosted when we came together. Uh, this relationship has enriched every aspect of my life, and I tell my students, the most important decision you make in life is who you marry. 
So don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't marry that right person. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the second most important decision in life is who's your PhD advisor, by the way. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but I know there's been some talk about did you meet somebody, but I'll tell you, the way you know it's the right person is, is you ask yourself, will this person enrich every aspect of my life? It's not just the passion and the romance, but will this person, that's important too, but... <laughs> But will, will, will this person enrich every part of my life, make me better at, at everything that I am? That's the way you know you have the right person. And I've found it, and I wish that all of you find too. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. I'll add to that. Add? Oh, yeah. Want to um, add to that? So I found a wonderful husband, um, and I would say he has enriched every part of my life. I think uh, being female, especially in industry, when you're working for large corporations and you have to travel, you know, to other parts of the world. I, I have literally traveled all around the world, um, and that's one of the benefits of working in the industry is you do get to, you know, get exposed to a lot of different things and countries and people and cultures. And there always had to be someone at home to help me out, right? Whether that was my mother when my kids were little to help me, you know, take care of my kids, or my husband, who is truly an amazing uh, man. He uh, has his own trading and financial firm, um, so he's self-employed and does his own thing. But he's always there for our kids and our children. And I think, you know, I would strongly agree, you know, don't ever let anybody tell you, you know, to settle for anything less than what you want and do find that right person that's willing to support you in what you're doing in your own endeavors and support your kids and your family life. Yes, thank you, thank you. Do you wanna to add to that? Sure, sure. I'd like to add too, first, thank you so much and for everyone here who has blazed the trail in the LGBTA community. My foster daughter, Clara, is gay. Uh, we uh, took her in as a foster child in, speaking of redneck areas, uh, no, I shouldn't say it that way. Well, northern Idaho was a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just put it that way. That was perhaps not the easiest for her. Uh, but she's about to be attend going from a community college to a regular college. And one of the questions in her mind, I think, is as so many for mine at that age, was will I be accepted? And for her, the dual challenge, but now seeing the hope. So thank you mm. so much. Um, Jeff was wonderful. He supported me in everything I did. It's not easy to have a type A personality wife flitting around the country. Um, we, both he and I were a second marriage. We learned a lot from the first. Not, not saying anything wrong with our either partner. I liked his, his previous wife and he probably would have liked my ex-husband, but not a good match. So pick the right PhD advisor too. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the spousal support is critical, and that, right. that, I think, is what enriches you in each piece and lets you be who you are Thank and you. to be with you forever. So that flows wonderfully into our next question. Many of you wanted to know about balance. How do you balance family? How do you balance kids, uh, a partner with a career in STEM? Can you comment on how you have been successful and maybe in some ways even unsuccessful at balancing family life with your career? So it is a challenge. I, I wouldn't say that I have a good balance, uh, but I do have a balance. Um, I do um, a whole lot of different things for the IBM company. And you know, one of the things that I do tell young folks, you know, you're gonna spend 40 to 60 hours a week you know, doing something. You better make it something that you know and love doing and that you have a lot of passion about. That doesn't mean you dedicate your entire life to it. Um, you do have to focus on your family, your children, your kids, and you know, your husband, and spending one-on-one -on -one time with each and every one of them. I have two kids. I have my daughter that's 23 years old, and she probably could care less if she ever sees me at this point in time. Um, but I do have a 14-year-old son, and he's very special to me as well. And so I do make it a point every day um, when I'm at home to do homework with him. That's why I'm studying Python and Spark and getting into newer technologies and looking at technology through his eyes has really been you know, amazing because he's grown up in this technology dig digital age as many of you have and it's a whole other perspective than you know, what I went through growing up. 
I'd say, you know, the other thing that I try and do is have some of my own me time. Um, so I do do yoga and I do it from, you know, 5.30 in the morning till 6.30 in the morning. And, you know, so normally I would have preferred to be asleep in bed. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I found that if I didn't get up early in the morning, I didn't have that me time. And I really do find that yoga helps me de-stress, helps me, you know, look at life in a different perspective and come to work with in a Zen kind of a mood. Um, so I think that's, you know, been very, very beneficial for me. Mm. Um, so work-life balance is a, you know, a challenge. I do know uh, my husband has my assistant's phone number. And whenever he needs me to be at any of the kids' events or to come home early or to do something, he makes it a point to just pick up the phone, give her a call and say, hey, Shirley, can you make sure Romelia gets out of work at 3 p.m. today? And she will make sure she comes and packs my bag, comes to my meeting and tells me it's time for you to leave work. Um, so whatever <laughs> it is that, that oh works for you yeah. to get that life balance <laughs> is what you need to be doing. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Deborah, do you want to share a bit? Sure, so I don't think anyone would put me up as a poster child for having gotten it right. <laughs> I tend to think of it as a work-life flow as opposed to a balance because it constantly changes. Uh, I've had times when the personal has had to take priority where I've canceled even in very important things um, to do something at home. I've also had times when I've needed to cancel what's going on at home for what's going on at work. And at work, I've had times where I've canceled whole rafts of meeting when one group really needed me. Uh, whether it's a technical challenge, uh, having to brief Congress on a program, knock on wood, um, <laughs> or something else. So it's really what I've found works for me, and it's taken a long while to get here, is to have a good sense of what is most important at any given moment for me to do with the energy I can bring at the day. And an exercise that I've done for several years now is to have a list of the top 10 things blending work and personal. I find mixing them up works best for me. So what's most important to me thinking about health-wise? Uh, what's my priority at work? What am I learning? What is it I need to have on my mind? 10 of those things, three doesn't work because then I'm throwing important things off the raft. And just look at them and then at night, uh, I go back to my list and without judgment, I'll check off did I work on those things. And the without judgment is important because some days, like I say, you throw out the whole slate. But by having the 10 things that are most important to me, being willing to change those, look at them in the morning, get a kind of a sense, and be willing to throw out that agenda if that isn't what happens to be the correctness. And then what I found the key was coming back and that self-assessment at night to see how I was doing that self-accountability really works well for me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, next question, Romelia, this is really directed toward you. Um, have you ever practiced mindfulness in the workplace to help you get through stressful, <laughs> challenging, and overwhelming times? And if so, how has that helped you, and what tips can you provide for our audience today? So to me, mindfulness is about maintaining composure. Um, certainly, you know, as with any kind of a, you know, an environment where you're dealing with customers and clients that can be very, very demanding, um, their view is always right. And in some cases, you may feel like you need to stand your ground. Um, but one of the things that I know I've done is to take a step back and just say, okay, um, take a deep breath, don't react to things. And I think the more and more that I've practiced that, um, I do not respond to any email that you know comes in and makes my blood pressure start to rise. I just <laughs> ignore it for a half day. And you'll be surprised how when you take that approach and you just you know, breathe in deeply um, and come back with a cool head, how everything will turn out a whole lot better. If I'm in a meeting and um, someone is irritating me, I have, you know, in some instances, you know, I'll sit and I'll listen because listening is a very important skill to have. So I'll listen and instead of reacting and, you know, getting into the moment, what I'll do is I'll just very calmly say, oop, um, something's come up and I have to go to another meeting, but I'll be back in a little while. And so you do learn how you know, to use some mindfulness <laughs> in a very go. tactful way with your that. colleagues. I like that a lot. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that? Oh, about mindfulness? Yes, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, th that's uh, a way to get through of uh, the stressful parts of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that when you have a lot of deadlines, I don't mind, I, I know how to handle if there's a major grant proposal due in a few days. I, I, I've been there and I can handle that. What, what gets me is when I have a million little things, like a big long list of small deadlines all at the same time. So I 
make a priority list. And, and uh, uh, but I try to tell myself, I tell myself that I, I can only do what's humanly possible. And I will take a minute to just stop and breathe and, and just enjoy the day and then get back to the grind. So I do want to add one thought. Having a 20-year-old to 23-year-old, that teaches you a lot of mindfulness. They're going to tell you <laughs> things that you don't want to react to. You just sit there and you smile yeah. and you don't say anything. That's been the best training ever, having a, yeah. a student of that age. I love That's it. Excellent. I love it. Um, one thing that everyone in the room has experienced is failure. And a lot of questions that came up asked, how do you deal with failure? Um, you know, what, what, what do you do when that shows up? For me, it's dark chocolate. I mean, it just makes everything better. Um, but I'm curious to know, in what ways have you uh, experienced failure? And then how have you dealt with it? How have you grown from it? I'd say for me, um, you know, certainly there was a manager that comes to mind um, that worked with me at IBM. And he said, you know, Romelia, I don't think you'll ever be a great presenter. I don't think you have the ability to have that flow and that articulation in your speech. Um, and I would say, you know, he, he told me you need to go back into the development lab and just be writing code. And I knew in my heart, you know, uh, I didn't argue with him. That was one of those mindful moments. I didn't argue with him. I just said, okay. Um, and then, you know, I, I told you I'm very competitive. I'm, and if someone tells me you can't do this, you'll never be a great presenter. I set my mind to it and I'm going to be a great presenter. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, don't let anybody stop you. Um, I would say the other thing is do not have fear. I was talking to my daughter and, and she was working as an intern at IBM and I was you know, pressed for time and I said, you know, I need to uh, fill in an application for, um, for a, a, an award that I was up for. And I said, I really don't have time to do this, but you know my career. And I said, fill in the application for me. So she got nervous and she said, okay, I'll take care of it. And she comes back with the application all filled in and she says, you know, here it is for your review. I said, I don't have time to review, we're submitting it. Um, and she asked me later on, she said, aren't you afraid you're going to fail? And I said, I'm never afraid I'm gonna fail. And I said, because you know what? I know you did the very best you could in support of me. This was the best we could do together and we haven't failed. Um, I was one of the finalists for the Dallas-Fort Worth area Tech Titans. Um, and I'm very proud of that accomplishment that I had just this year and there is no room for failure. No matter how much you strive, nothing is ever gonna be perfect. I think someone else said that. You just gotta do your best and move forward. That's great, thank you, thank you. You know, so scientifically speaking, something that's a failure is just something that didn't come out the way we thought it would or wanted it to. Mm -hmm. And so really, it's only a failure if we don't make it better or learn from it in some way. And how I deal with those things that don't come out the way I want them to do is to think, to remind myself of that. And I find different ways of practice that will help. Most recently, I'm learning from rock climbing about failure. So I took up rock climbing, mostly in a gym, but also outside this year. I went rock climbing in Turkey, which was wonderful. Um, but in the gym, if you don't find yourself falling off the wall from time to time, it means you're not pushing yourself hard enough. And I think that's a great metaphor. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to try to climb something that's so impossible you can't get anywhere off the ground. That's just misapplication of your skill set to the problem, which is a different kind of a failure than falling off the wall. You also don't want to get to the point where everything you climb you get right perfectly because mm -hmm. that means you haven't learned anything. So I like that case where I'm not actually going to die. <laughs> I've got the rope, but I'm learning something. I'm trying to te new techniques, and I do the same thing in the office. Fantastic. Thank you. Mary Jo. That's good. So I was introduced to to failure actually later in life because when I was about five years old, I heard the word failure and I didn't know what it meant. So I asked my mother and my mother said, failure is when you don't try. So I, for many years, I believed that's what the word meant. That's not what the dictionary says, but I thought that's what it meant. So, so, so I was raised to believe that there's no such thing as failure. Now, as a professor, anybody who writes grant proposals probably knows what failure is. <laughs> and you, you dust yourself off mm. and you do it again. Uh, so, so I think sometimes students come to me and they say, oh, well, you, you, probably don't, you probably don't know how I feel because you've never failed. I said, oh, yes, I have. 
I mean, after I took freshman biology, I got a letter from the biology department saying that I was, actually I wanted to be, I was never declared a biology major, I declared up front as a chemistry major, but I got a letter saying that I wouldn't be a good prospect for a, as a biology major. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now I'm working with the genome, working with drug discovery. And, uh, <laughs> so so uh, when people tell you you can't, <laughs> don't believe them. Yes. If you think back to your 20-year-old self, what advice would you give that woman? So I do have a 20-year-old self. Um, her name is Christina. I think the advice that I, I give her is don't let anyone ever take away any of your dreams. You can do anything you set out to accomplish, but always you know, focus on what makes you happy and makes you you. Um, I think it's very important, you know, um, excelling at something, becoming the next IBM Distinguished Engineer or PhD researcher, you know, will come easy when you're doing the things that you have a lot of passion about. And I would say that is the key to success is, you know, one of those other C's of success is chuckle. Uh, make sure you're not taking yourself too seriously, enjoying what you're doing, and just, you know, delighting yourself with every moment of your life. Yes, thank you. Deborah, what would you tell your 20-year-old self? I was mulling that over. I had a couple of different things I would have said, and then, and then it really just came to me. Um, our 20-year-old selves, whether you're there or past 20, they're going to make the right choice. They're going to make the right choice because there is no wrong choice, really. There's what do you value and where do you put your time. And so I guess the only thing I would like to do is to take the stress out of that for whether you're 20, 50, 60, 70, 30, is just to remind ourselves we're making our best choice in any given situation, mm -hmm. and it is the right one for us or we would not be making it. So trust yourself. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, well, I, there is a piece of advice I would, have, would give my 20-year-old self, and that <laughs> is to seek mentoring because I didn't know how to write a scholarship application, a fellowship application, a graduate school application. I managed to stumble along and get through, but it would have been a whole lot better if I'd had a mentor. So that's, that's what I would say, and that's what I'd say to you, seek mentoring. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Romelia, can you talk a bit about maybe how you coped with cultural, religious, and societal norms throughout your journey? That was one of the questions that came from our audience. Yeah, so um, I mentioned that I do a lot of work in Latin America, and, and you know, I mentioned I also practice mindfulness. Um, you know, there have been times when you know, I don't quite understand why certain decisions are being made, why they may say, you know, we, we want someone with this kind of skill or talent, and certainly you know, I may have talent in that area, but decisions are made to say, we want to send the you know, Anglo, blue-eyed blue um, individual down to Latin America versus yourself. And I think you know, certainly culture has taught me that you know, in some cases we want to see someone different than ourselves in front of us. And in some cases we want to see someone that looks like us in front of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd say the best thing that you could do is trust the people that are in the positions to make the right judgments. I don't think anyone is ever out to harm you or to make you feel bad. And so you just have to you know, be well poised and set your best foot forward and you will be picked the majority of the time. And other times it may not be appropriate for you to be the one. In terms of uh, religion, you know, um, I do pray a lot and I would say you know, that plays a major part in my life. Um, I am Catholic and um, so you know, part of me says there are times when you know, things are stressful at work and I will meditate, pray about those things. And I believe, you know, very strongly that, you know, we all need to be exploring cultures and other kinds of religion, other cultures, so that we learn about our own culture from that as well. So I would encourage you to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah, you talked about uh, battling cancer twice yourself and with your husband. 
Um, can you share a bit about what yourself before and after that experience? How did, how did that change you? How did you grow? What did you learn from it? And how has it helped you become the woman that you are today? Because all of us are going to experience, I mean, I'm sure we all know someone who has suffered or who we've even lost to cancer. And just to hear your story as a survivor and also someone who's witnessed someone who has not. All right. One in eight breast cancer. Mm. One in eight. Uh, so a statistics background is great. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so STEM, go STEM. Uh, but seriously, I think um, before I had the first bout with cancer, which we discovered on, I think it was my second wedding anniversary, something like that. It was this odd thing. So I'd been feeling odd all summer and I'd gone in and I found what I thought was a lump and they said, it's nothing, come back. And I'm not usually a doctor person and I thought, I'm just not right. And they did three or four tests, nothing. I said, all right, anything wrong with taking the lump out? Well, we shouldn't unnecessary surgery. So look, take it out, it's my lump, I don't want it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So they took it out and they called me two days later and I got the words you usually like to hear, which is you're right and we're wrong. <laughs> I didn't like hearing it that time um, because it turned out I had stage one breast cancer, almost stage two, and it was fairly aggressive. If I'd come back in six or 12 months, I would probably not have been here today. Uh, so I learned from that a couple of very valuable things. One was trust myself when I thought something was wrong. But I also learned that one can go through facing death and make some really difficult decisions. And I was the head of our team. There was never any doubt that in my cancer, the doctors were support staff and I was making the decisions. And that's not to put down anybody or say that's the only way to do it. That's the way we did it. I learned to rely on myself to hold my life in my hands and make choices about chemotherapy and radiation and adjuvant treatments and be the one to bear the consequences. Mm -hmm. That really taught me about accountability in a very different way. Uh, it's different to, different to be accountable for grades or quality of work, and I wasn't doing national security at the time, so it's been extraordinarily helpful now. Um, the first and second bow of both, and also my husband's, to think about what it's like to hold other people's lives in my hands now, because literally I was not kidding when I said we need to come up with breakthroughs that keep this country safe, and that means saving lives. And if I guess wrong, people will die. And they won't die in a place where I'll get to see them, so I won't even know. It'll be the five, 10 years out. So when I watch the news forever, I'm gonna wonder. Uh, so it taught me how to make those kinds of choices, and it taught me to forgive myself for getting it wrong, and it taught me that if I wanted to go up against another professional and I thought I was right, go for it. Yeah. Medical profession didn't discover either of my cancers. I did. They were wrong twice. They took great care of me once identified, but they were wrong twice. So I learned um, lack of trust in a sense, but also self-confidence and the fact that you've got great medical, that's been great. Uh, for my husband losing him, I learned there was something more important than living. It was being alive when you're alive. Mm. He lived every moment, and this is his birthday, so I'm really glad to say this to you today. Wow. wow. That man lived every moment. That man loved me. That man, while his fingers weren't working from the chemo and while his brain was cloudy, he cared more about me and his family than most people on their best days. He told me when he was going to give up the fight because it was too hard. Mm. He says, is that okay? I said, yes. And we then briefed the hospice nurse, and this was really hysterical because I really do mean we briefed the hospice nurse. We've got two nerds here, okay? And you've got, this is funny. <laughs> so she came and she said, how are you doing? And you know, we're in hospice and we all know where it's going and he, he isn't doing well. And he turned and he looked at her, he said, Paige, Deb and I have had a talk, and we've decided that I'm just going to let go because this is just too much and it's not fair. And he turned to me and said, and Deb supports me in this decision. So <laughs> it was wow. a team decision. So it taught me that his willingness to let go didn't have anything to do with his being alive or his love for me. It was different. And so I found since that day I've valued things differently. Um, 
I've made different choices, especially losing Jeff, but both cancers. My second one was while he was ill. So while he was ill, this is <laughs> on the, so if I think about two weeks after we discovered his cancer, I got mine. So in a sense, it really let me put in context how you make your own quality of life decisions next to someone else. It was clearly his was the, the worse or cancer. And so we could make those choices. So I really learned a lot about decision making and caring. And my agency backed me to the hilt. Mm. My agency gave me new responsibilities. I took on another leadership job that was pro while he was sick. They supported my being out to take care of him. And then they gave me this job this last year, knowing that I'm still fighting and wrestling with the internal decisions. So I also learned what it's like to work. And I ask this, I hope all of you, as you think through your current jobs and where you go, think about the kind of support you'll get in your dire need from your friend in your organization. And if the answer is it won't be there, really reflect on whether you should be there. Because they helped me, and they could have just set me aside and said, come back later, and that would have looked compassionate. It wasn't what I needed. I needed to work, and I needed to be let be home, and I needed to be trusted to make those choices. Mm. That's probably longer than you wanted. Oh, that was great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Our last question of the afternoon, uh, and we'll start with you, Mary Jo. Tell us what advice would you have for Stocknistas who are pursuing STEM education and STEM careers today? Uh, get lots of research experience, <laughs> find a mentor, believe in yourself, and always keep your culture with you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Deborah, what thoughts would you leave with our audience today? I don't think I could better that. Be yourself. You've picked a great field. Be, a, be, be willing to try other things in STEM, but I have never regretted choosing a STEM career, whether it's been as a leader or a scientist. I echo the get lots of experience up front, though. It's just going to get harder down the road. <laughs> There's never going to be more time than you have today, no matter what age or where you are in your career. So do it now if you want to do it, but stick with it. It's great stuff. And you'll make a big difference in the world. Thank yes. you. Yes. Amelia. So for me, I think the, you know, I echo what our, our panelists have said, um, but I add to that, you know, being a master inventor is about, you know, imagining the world as we want to see it, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now. And I would encourage you to never lose the hunger and, you know, the desire to want to dream big dreams, whether they be in technology or in your home life and always have fun doing what you're doing. I, you, know, you have to position yourself in a job where you love coming into work every day. And I, you know, I certainly have worked hard to do that. It didn't come you know, my first day at IBM. It probably came you know, probably about seven years ago when I started to be able to shape what I'm doing at IBM. And I thoroughly enjoy every moment of every day that I'm having at work today. And I wish that for all of you here today as well. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much. Can you uh, help me thank one more time this amazing panel for their transparency with you, for sharing their experiences?